Now, you don't really believe all that stuff in the Bible, do you? Do you? That was the very first question right out of the gate that uh, on that old uh, program, The O'Reilly Factor, that the news analysts fired away at their guest uh, that evening. And the question seemed so pointed that it even caught my attention as a teenager and caused me to uh, look up and listen, which looking back was probably the objective. Um, now, in spite of being caught off guard, the guests that evening seemed to do okay in their response. But I wonder how many of us, maybe in a similar situation, but without the uh, gotcha intimidation factor, uh, how we would fare. How would we do if we were asked what we really believe about the Bible, and maybe digging in with journalistic instincts if the follow-up questions of things like, how did you get there, and what do you do with that idea, and so forth, were, were asked. How would you respond? And how far would your explanation go? How far would it go? I mean, being able to coherently explain what you believe about the Bible to a skeptical teenager or a curious friend or just to your own soul seems important. In fact, uh, you might be the skeptical teenager, curious friend, or someone struggling with doubts which have left you wondering where you really stand on important issues in life. It wouldn't be surprising given the unhelpful reality that the new virtue of doubt disguised as an open mind has become the plague of the information age. The constant flow of, of new ideas and new arguments have left many of us with more questions than answers. We oftentimes uh, feel the weight of that, that old Italian proverb that one fool can ask more questions than seven wise men can answer, right? But into that environment of uncertainty and skepticism steps the Bible, claiming to be the written record of God's special revelation to man. This book of books, uh, unashamedly and non-pulsed, uh, makes sweeping claims about God and life and you, and me, with Jesus, the Son of God, as being the central figure throughout it all. And if you've ever read it, you may have picked up that it has a tone that's not very suggestive, but authoritative. Right? Talk about a stark contrast. And so let me ask you, what do you really believe about all that stuff in the Bible? Well, this week and next, I want us to consider what we believe about and what we do with this book. And perhaps, unsurprisingly, the Bible itself has plenty to say about this topic. Uh, in fact, in the Apostle Peter's second letter in chapter 1, we find a similar situation to ours. I invite you to turn there. Peter, one of Jesus' original 12 disciples here, was nearing the end of his life when he writes to Christians who were encountering certain uh, teachers and leaders who were uh, challenging the apostles' message. As we try to kind of piece the situation together, it would appear that they were saying that the apostles made things up. They embellished things a little. They, they, they added a, a miracle here and a miracle there to kind of beef up their credibility. Uh, and that their uh, views on sin and Jesus coming back were outdated. They're outdated. Sound familiar? And with the apostles passing away, you could imagine these Christians struggling with the lack of certainty, of rootedness. They must have felt like someone was trying to you know, pull the rug out from under their way of living. And of course, if you can get a Christian questioning the basis for the gospel message, 
then their effectiveness in living like Jesus, their fruitfulness in ministering to others, and ultimately their confidence in salvation plummets. Just plummets. If you've ever found yourself questioning whether, uh, you know, everything that you've believed, then, you know, to one degree or another, you can relate to that feeling of being zapped like they were. And here, Peter writes to them with a desire to correct that by way of reminder that they might be established in the truth. And in verse 16, he begins making this case. 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter begins to make his case here. Here's his first piece of evidence, and then he begins to unpack it in verse 17, where he says, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was born to him from the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter's addressing then the kind of authority as witnesses that the apostles had as personal witnesses to Jesus in all of his glory. And then verse 19, he goes on. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Uh, as in, in the words of the apostles, that those words l uh, from their witness lined up with the Old Testament scriptures as another piece of evidence. Next, to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star, that's an Old Testament reference to Christ, rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but what Peter is doing here reminds me of those old mathematical proofs that we had to do in school, you know, where, where you would have to list out the logical chain of big ticket reasons that link together, showing how your answer was correct. I hated doing those. But that's like what Peter's doing here. It's like it. He's building a chain of evidences to establish these Christians in the correct way of living and believing that's based on an authority that's rooted in the very words and actions of God himself. That's Peter's point in making this case. If the ultimate source of this message, these words first spoken, now written, from, or is from God himself, then Peter, as one of the apostles, along with the Old Testament prophets, are carrying forward the very word of God to them, and to us. And as such, it forms a kind of final authority for our lives. And when we get down, that down to kind of the street level for you and for me, we see that that means that what we believe about the scriptures is seen in our response to the scriptures. What we believe about the scriptures is seen in our response to the scriptures. He's not talking about the scriptures like they are Milton's Paradise Lost, right? Where this is just a great fictional story that you can learn some moral lessons from. Or that they're like the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? Where it's just full of historical facts that you may or may not be interested in from time to time. No, he's saying that we made known to you what the Son of God made known to us. And it aligns perfectly with what God the Father has been saying all along as recorded in the Old Testament. Author and theologian J.I. Packer, talking about the nature of God's word, puts it this way. Two facts about the triune Jehovah 
are assumed, if not actually stated in every single biblical passage, like the one we have here. The first is that he's king, absolute monarch of the universe, ordering all its affairs, working out his will and all that happens within it. The second is that he speaks, uttering words that express his will in order to cause it to be done. Now, that's the kind of solid foundation of truth that can't get any more solid that also exerts authority on our lives. Think of it this way. If I was leaving my four boys at home for a couple of hours, maybe on a Saturday afternoon, and I left them with a note that said something like, hey, boys, I'll be back in a bit. While I'm gone, don't forget to do your chores and don't eat the ice cream in the freezer, love dad. And in my home, that note would constitute final authority, or so I'd like to think. Um, But how they would respond to that note says a lot about what my boys actually believe doesn't it? But it's not hard, for me at least, to imagine that my third son, Seth, uh, who maybe didn't see me write the note, uh, decides that he thinks that my brothers, they're just making it all up because they want the ice cream for themselves, right? It's not hard to imagine that my second son, Jonathan, after waiting two whole hours, uh, begins to think that, that maybe what I really meant was that They couldn't eat the uh, year-and-a-half-old inedible ice cream bars in the freezer chest, but the ice cream in the freezer, now that's okay, right? And it's not hard to imagine one of them just deciding that dad wrote the note, yes, but he's just taking too long and just decides to eat the ice cream. But if they said to themselves, well... He's my dad. He loves me. I love him. So as his son, I'm going to do my chores and wait to eat the ice cream. Well, listen, that kind of obedience, I mean, that deserves something, right? That, that's the kind of obedience that makes you want to take that plain old ice cream and put an Oreo crust with it and smother it in chocolate sauce and peanut butter sauce and some toasted pecans and some whipped cream and let's leave now. And, right, that's the, I mean, whew, that's the kind of ice cream cake response that deserves And it would show that they not just believed something about the note, but they believed something ultimately about my authority. They're interconnected. And friends, what we believe about the scriptures is seen in our response to the scriptures. And Peter's prompting a certain response here by showing how the very words of the message he brought to these Christians are accurate, powerful and special because they're from the Lord. And then when a Christian or a skeptic then or now is able to see that, that they can then find an authority to root and establish their lives on. So let's take a closer look at Peter's evidences here and how we can respond. First, we see that he's saying that scripture is accurate. Scripture's accurate. The scriptures are accurate in everything they address. Now, how does he make that case? Well, first, in verse 16, Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Now, this is a very important statement because, listen, if you wanted to increase your credibility with people, would you tell stories about how you messed up over and over and over again? like the disciples do in the Gospels? Would you pull in unlikely disqualified witnesses to make your case like women were in the first century and yet are the first ones to encounter the risen Christ and believe? Would you make claims that are 
easy to disprove, but hard to prove, like the resurrection or miracles or crowds of thousands of people. No. No, you don't. Unless, unless it's accurate. That's his point. Next, Peter says that he and the other apostles were eyewitnesses. They didn't hear about this from someone else. No, they claimed to have been uh, there and to have seen these things with their own eyes. That scholarship has shown again and again the authenticity of the New Testament writings or authorship and exhaustive proof for their timing matching their first century claims. But the question remains for them as eyewitnesses whether or not you can trust their testimony. Well, if you know much about history, you know that the early church was intensely persecuted and that the apostles gave up everything including their lives. It would seem that they passed the ultimate eyewitness test in dying for their testimony. And what did they gain for it? In the material sense, nothing. But if they were accurately telling the truth, then in reality, they gained everything. Finally, verse 19, Peter says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Meaning that the way Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies showed both their accuracy and the accuracy of Peter's message. If you've been here for any stretch of time, you've likely heard from this pulpit example after example about how the Old Testament foreshadowed redemption through a Savior, which Jesus perfectly fulfilled. And not in some kind of set of vague generalities, but in high definition. That's the kind of accuracy that shows links in a very long chain of evidences, and it should grow our confidence. Now, though a lot more could be said here for Scripture's accuracy, what is the response it provokes? Well, while like any decision in life, what you and I decide to believe, there's an element of faith attached to it, the kind of faith that the Bible calls for is not blind faith. The accuracy of the apostles and the prophet's message recorded in the scriptures should evoke in us a response that we want to learn it, to learn it. Even if you're a skeptic, wouldn't it be best to consider the actual thing itself to make a decision? And for the Christian, Peter, in verse 15, right before this passage, specifically states that his hope, his desire for these Christians was that they could recall these truths at any time because of this reminder. After all, we learn those things and we commit them to memory that are really important to life. They're the kinds of things that matter. But I wonder if we have disconnected that from the scriptures. I've read that Bart Ehrman who... um, I was a graduate from my alma mater and uh, many other schools and whatnot, uh, who's now a a famous atheist and college professor, will ask uh, a room full of students at the beginning of a term, how many of them believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God? Uh, He teaches at a southern university, and he says a, a lot of students actually raise their hands. And uh, then he, he, he goes on, and he, he gets out a copy of uh, the book Harry Potter. And he holds it up, and he says, how many of you have read this book cover to cover? And he says a lot of hands go up. And then he gets out a copy of the Bible, and he goes, how many of you have read this cover to cover? He says not a lot of hands go up. His point, do you really believe that it's the word of God if you don't even bother to read it? And I wonder how we would fare. Because friends, what we believe about the scriptures is seen in our response to the scriptures. And if we have disconnected the response of learning the scriptures, then let's repent. And let's allow the 
accuracy of the scriptures to ignite in us a new desire to be learning them and allow that desire to grow in our hearts. Now, building on that kind of response, Peter also shows the scripture's powerful. The scriptures can change our lives. In verse 19, Peter says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Why should we pay attention to scripture according to Peter in this verse? Well, it's because the scriptures contain a kind of glory, a kind of weighty authority that's like light in a dark room. Throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we see that God's words have power. And here, Peter points out that God's word has power to bring clarity to our lives. Clarity. To our lives. Imagine with me if you and I were sitting down for a cup of coffee, and in that conversation, I was asking, you know, do you really believe all this stuff, you know, in the Bible? And if you said yes, and I asked you why, and, and you said uh, it's because it's the Word of God, if I was to press you farther there, I wouldn't be surprised in the least if it was your reasoning that your belief had more, that your reasoning had more to do with the power of the scriptures than any aspect of their accuracy or their reliability or whatever else, whatever else. Whether it was the way that they explained and showed you good and evil or our sin or creation and design and purpose or eternity or whatever else, what oftentimes persuades people like you and me is when we encounter the scriptures for ourselves and we find that they explain our lives to us. And when the world around us starts to come into focus because of the scriptures, that's powerful evidence for their authority and for their source. And when we think about the extent of that kind of clarity you know, that they provide us, it's immense. It's not like when you and I go to see the optometrist and we spend 30 minutes with him going better one, you know, or two, better one. It's not that kind of dialing into that precision. This was much, much bigger. This was somebody handing us a flashlight in the dark of night so that we could go from seeing practically nothing at all to having enough light to get by until the day comes. Friends, that's the kind of power of Scripture. They give us clarity for our life today until Jesus returns someday. And when we see the power of the truth in them, it should evoke a response. After all, what is our natural response to light in a dark room? We trust it. We trust it. We make our moves by it. Granted, it may still uh, be hard for us and feel very risky for us to believe and practice what the scriptures say about marriage and work, our words and forgiveness and more. But every time we do, we not only show our trust in the scriptures, but ultimately in our heavenly father. It may not always feel intuitive, especially at first, but this is part of being God's children, if it's all true. To return to our analogy, we show trust that God loves us and knows what's best for us when we don't just follow our feelings, but we take him at the plain meaning of his written word and do our chores and wait to eat the ice cream and stop looking for loopholes. Doing so is trusting in God's best for us and will not only save us from injury, but it will give us a reason for hope of an ice cream cake to come. Which brings us to our last characteristic. Peter points out to these Christians that simply put, Scripture is special. Scripture is special. Why are the Scriptures authoritative? Well, not just because they're accurate about what happened and what was said, and not just because they're powerful at giving someone clarity about their life, but because they are special in their origin. 
In verse 21, Peter says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. For Peter, Scripture is a technical word. It's not just any important religious writing, right? But divinely inspired writing. He wants it to be clear that Scripture is not the result of someone's good ideas or their own interpretation of spirituality, but the work of the Holy Spirit instead. But how can that be? How can that be? Well, this little word carried here is the Greek word pharaoh, and it means to ferry something. Uh, So picture the wind filling the sails of a ship. That's the idea here. That means that God didn't drop golden tablets from the sky. Rather, he breathed his words through the apostles and the prophets, using them to create the scriptures. Ergo, the scriptures should retain both a sense that someone like a Peter or someone like a Paul wrote them, but they should also be special and different. They shouldn't be something less, but something more than what an ordinary man would or even could write. And that's the kind of final authority that the scriptures claim. Given that idea, it actually makes perfect sense that Peter would trace the message back to this point and then drop the case and walk away. Again, given this idea, it's why the entire world can be seen in support of the scriptures and their claims, but no amount of accuracy, reliability, or even life change can confer a higher authority than the claim of God as being the author. And given the heights of this claim, Is it any wonder uh, that Jonathan Edwards once said that unless men may come to a reasonable, solid persuasion and conviction of the truth of the gospel by the internal evidences of it, by the sight of its glory, it is impossible that those who are illiterate and unacquainted with history should have any thorough or effectual conviction at all. They may, see, they may without this see a great deal of probability of it. It may seem reasonable for them to give much credit to what learned men and historians tell them. But to have a conviction so clear and evident and assuring as to be sufficient to induce them with boldness to sell all confidently and fearlessly to run the venture of the loss of all things and of doing the most exquisite and long-continued torments, and to trample the world underfoot, and to count all things but dung for Christ, the evidence they can have from history cannot be sufficient. That's where we stand. Unless the Lord opens our eyes, like Peter, to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, by faith alone, then we may learn a lot about the Bible, but still miss its ultimate point along with the joy and freedom it brings when it establishes our lives on its authority. But if he does, if the response to the word of God is what has evoked in our hearts faith, if the response of our hearts are here, then what it evokes ultimately is celebration. We celebrate it. It's like a picture of someone that we love. We don't look at the picture and go, wow, what a gorgeous frame around it, right? Or wow, look how perfectly they hung this picture, just balanced, just so. Or wow, check out the paper that this picture's printed on. No, you celebrate the picture because of who the picture presents. In the same way, we don't just celebrate some kind of ink and paper and binding of our copy of the scriptures. No, we celebrate who they present. Like the psalmist in Psalm 119, we celebrate the one whose beauty, whose truths, whose accomplishments and commands are being presented. We celebrate the scriptures because of the Savior, Jesus Christ, they present to us. And so friends, celebrate it. Frame it. Carve it, wear it, 
paint it, talk of it, write about it, sing it, share it, and in every good and godly way imaginable, celebrate it. Because ultimately, we celebrate the authors whose accurate, powerful, and final authority has been revealed through it. That's what we celebrate. We pray with me. Lord, we recognize not just our need for your word, but Lord, our need to come back to the authority of it. And throughout our life, Lord, in many places of our hearts, we have not just showed a struggle, but we have showed a resistance and a rebellion to your word. Lord, may you soften our hearts as we see the truth of it, as we see the promises of it, as we recognize it as truly belonging to you. May you soften our hearts towards it, where that we no longer hold out our own authority as being the place that we want to camp on, but may we instead gladly submit to your word, desiring that above all, we might celebrate it because we celebrate you. And we celebrate your authority that you have shared with us, through us, and over us because of your word to us. And so, Lord, we pray these things, trusting that you're going to do the work of providing light to us in a dark world through your word. We pray that in your name. Amen.